Well, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Paramount Theater and the uh, Rob Orchard uh, stage. Uh, you know, uh, it's great having two presidents on this stage together. Uh, Bert Giamatti, who was one time president of Yale and then went on to become baseball commissioner, once said that being a college president is no way for an adult to make a living. <laughs> and uh, it often feels that way, but not today. Um, I'm going to try in my story to make some connections between Olin and Emerson, between uh, the, hum the humanistic studies and the engineering studies. Um, and uh, I, I've humorously described Emerson as MIT for the other side of the brain. Uh, <laughs> but for today's audience, I will revise my script to say that we're, we're, uh, we're Olin for the other side of the brain. <laughs> And that is to say, uh, like engineers, our students come to Emerson as doers, uh, and they know what they want to do, and they've known it since they were eight years old, and left to their own devices, that's all that they would do. Uh, the other attribute that we share is that uh, it is the doing part, and, and most of the education here, a lot of the education here is experiential at Emerson, as it is in an engineering school. They have laboratories, we have studios, but there are places where we come together to develop our, cre our creativity, our critical thinking, our collaboration, and our communication skills. And we both do that well. Let me tell you my story. My story is not a unique story. It's a twice told tale, to quote Hawthorne. Uh, I grew up in a foreign country called Kansas. Uh, <laughs> and um, I I came from what could only be described as very humble beginnings. Uh, I did not have, the house that I grew up in did not have indoor plumbing until I was six years old. Uh, the white communities around this little black enclave did in fact have plumbing, but we didn't uh, for reasons that might be obvious uh, to you. My mother, both of my grandmothers uh, cleaned houses until uh, well, all three of them died. And my father was uh, a laborer. But what we lacked in uh, means and in money was made up by uh, a, a love in our family and a real sense that education could be and should be in this country transformative. Like some of you in this audience today, I was the first in my family to go to college. Uh, and I had no mentors. I had no one to show me, uh, to make the invisible visible to me. Um, and there was a whole world out there uh, that was invisible to me, but it was unknown to me when I went to college. I went to my local, uh, my local uh, state university. I did very well in high school. And the most memorable experience is on the first or second day of school going in and meeting with the honors counselor and saying to him that I wanted to be an honors student and enroll in the honors program. I had my transcript and from high school in front of me, uh, letters of recommendation. He looked at neither of those. He looked at me and he said, this is not for you. And I, you know, I understood then that that was code for something else. Um, and he had made some decisions about whether or not I was uh, equipped to take on honors classes, not by what was in my head, but the color of my skin. Uh, and what I learned from then is that college is not what I thought it would be. Uh, I thought it would be a refuge. I thought it would be a place of idealism. I thought it would be a place where ideas mattered more than anything else. And I quickly learned um, that it's not an ivy tower. And in fact, what happens in colleges and universities is very much uh, connected to what happens in the human society. I took a leave of absence, really self-defeated, came back, finished my degree, went off to Harvard, came here, uh, and studied English uh, literature. When I told my father that I was headed off to Boston to study poetry, 
uh, <laughs> in Boston, you can imagine uh, that that was not the happiest moment of his life. Uh, but I came here uh, anyway and uh, studied 18th and 19th century British poetry and American uh, literature. Here are the two things that I took away from Harvard that were transformative for me. One is that um, I understood or began to understand that the purpose of an education was to make students not only fit company for others, but most important, fit company for themselves. Uh, and that all of education is uh, human, you know, it's humanistic. Um, uh, I also uh, learned that uh, from teaching literature um, that, it was, that it was part of the larger body of knowledge uh, and that what we do in the academy is to help our students understand the process by which, by which they seek to, to understand all that lies outside of themselves. That's what we do, it's simple as that. Uh, and so what that suggests is that all of knowledge is humanistic. It's all humanistic because it's all about humans and the human condition and solving human problems. So in that respect, and I think, I hope you take this away from your meetings today, that uh, the distinction between the sciences and the arts is a false distinction because we're all engaged uh, in that uh, process. Uh, after Harvard, I went to Colgate um, University uh, as dean. Uh, I remember uh, in 2000, I mean, 1988, December of 2021, um, listening to the radio or the television and understanding that a plane from Scotland on its way to New York, I mean, on its way from Franklin, Frankfurt to New York had dropped from the sky over Lockerbie, Scotland. 243 passengers died in the air, blown to bits, 11 people on the ground. I had seven students on that plane, uh, and I began to get calls from parents um, wanting information that they couldn't get from the federal uh, government. Uh, and I understood over the course of the two or three days that I was trying to sort out what had happened and uh, what was available to them for resources, that, uh, that parents looked to me uh, to take care of their children. And the larger, the larger lesson there was the nation looks to colleges and universities to solve uh, its most pressing problems, which came home uh, acutely four years later April 31st, um, 1992, the, the day after Rodney King had been acquitted. Uh, and there were riots in uh, NLA and other parts of the country. And I was sitting in my office and I could see out of the big window a horde of students marching um, uh, with purpose, shall we say, <laughs> towards my office. And I thought to myself, well, what does this have to do with me? This is 3,000 miles away. You know, I'm a hip, liberal, African-American president. And I've got all these students coming to confront me about something that happened elsewhere. Uh, and it reminded me again that uh, the colleges and universities are not ivy towers, but they sit centrally in human society. Uh, and what happens outside uh, affects us on the inside. Now, I'm just going to, I'm going to end by showing you this thing here. Uh, a French philosopher once said that the trouble with our times is the future is not what it used to be. The future is not what it used to be. We call this a phone, but it's not a phone. It's a uh, disintermediating machine. That is to say, it reduces the time between I want it and I have it. And it, and it shrinks the, t the space between I want it and I have it. Um, you know, we, we use this phone to take photographs, store photographs, watch movies, make movies, 
fall in love, escape from love, find friends, <laughs> run away from friends. Um, we use it for all sorts of things. And probably the most anachronistic thing on app on this disintermediated machine is the telephone. Um, and that brings me to what I think is a central issue today. It has to do with shoes. So I'll pick up on this theme and then stop. <laughs> the digital world is a heads-down world. The analog world is a heads-up world. And I will submit to you that this digital world destabilizes the truth. And it can be, as we've seen today, uh, I have to say this, with tweets coming from certain places, that it, dis it can destabilize the truth uh, and, um, uh, and, and, a, and it can be pernicious and uh, insidious in ways that are not helpful to the health uh, of this country. The analog world is the heads-up world. And that's what you're doing today. You're going to engage in the heads-up world. And I hope that through all of your stories that you discover not only something about yourselves, but you also discover your common humanity with those you uh, engage with today. So thank you so very, very much for being here. Uh, and um, I hope that you have a wonderful, productive day. Thank you. <laughs>